wearing 50 different other things. The dough is what we like to make. The same as you and you and you. A wedding, a wedding, it's gonna be a wedding, a wedding in pastry town. It's gonna be a wedding, a wedding in pastry town. This bride and groom belong to us, they come from pastry town. We'll bake a special wedding cake and bake it nice and brown. We'll make it big and wide and high, we'll make it reach up to the sky. To reach the top, you'll have to fly! What?
with love and a tablespoon of money. Mix them all together, pour into a loving cup, guaranteed to last for life. I now pronounce you man and wife. Yes, 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 yes. No. Yes. No.
boy, what a game, what a game, what a game. I'm Robinson Crusoe, and there's only me to please. I have my fun and frolic when I'm playing solitaire. I'm Robinson Crusoe, all alone and free from care. Never have appointments, there's no job that I can lose. No bad to have to nag me when I lay me down to snooze. I'm all by myself and glad to be alone, for I'm Robinson Crusoe. I'm happy. Kiss me! Get away from me!
look, you're a nice cow. I like you. But this place is only big enough for one of us. So get off this island! <laughs> I live every day just to sleep and just to eat. I'm all by myself and glad to be alone. For I'm a Robinson Crusoe. I'm happy all alone.
Now listen, Montgomery, before I go. The landlord won't take any more nonsense, so I put $50 rent money in this envelope. He'll be around tomorrow noon for it, so don't let anything happen to the money. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. Nothing will happen to the money, honey. Well, see that it doesn't. Goodbye, Montgomery. Goodbye, <laughs> Maggie Bell. Goodbye, Montgomery. Goodbye, Sue, you messy old creep. What's that? I said, uh, goodbye, Sue, uh, I I'll miss you a heap. <laughs> Maggie Bell and her sister Sue on the way to Nashville, you must really feel a sense of relief. I'll see how she laid Casey Jones when they took that red hot engine off his neck. <laughs> Walk me back to my house, will you, Calvin? Mm, 11.30. I got $50 Maggie Bell left me in an envelope. And I have to give it to the landlord at noon, or he'll lock us out of our place. He is a... Hey, look there on the curb. A woman's pocketbook. I'll get the thing before someone else sees it. <laughs> Excuse me, old chap. I do believe I saw that pocketbook first. Oh, I, I uh, didn't see you there, but... Uh, I do believe I saw it first. My friend here, 2020 Vision Burnside, will testify to that. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Now, see here. All I'm interested in is to find the rightful owner of the pocketbook. I think the first step is to open it and see if we can find some clue to his ownership. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Well, uh, let me see in here. Wow! <laughs> Yes, I wager there's four or five hundred dollars in there. Well, too bad there's no name and address in there. We're just going to have to split it. <laughs> just a moment, old chap, but there are some credentials in there. Well, we'll split them, too. Uh, uh, come <laughs> on. Uh, I mean identification. Oh, jolly good. The pocketbook belongs to a, a Mrs. Herbert to Williger, 2432 Lakeview Terrace. Uh, or telephone number here, too. Uh, uh, what say I pop in and give her a buzz from the apothecary? Hmm? Well, uh, there isn't too much time. Uh, why don't you go in the drugstore here and call her on the phone? <laughs> exactly what I had in mind. We might catch her in a uh, gratuitous mood. Uh, yeah, sir. Is that good or bad? Sounds a little on the naughty side. <laughs> I mean, she might offer a reward. Oh, yes, a reward. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Get on the phone. And I'll be right back, old biscuit. Yeah, hurry up, old cracker crumb. <laughs> <laughs> Peculiar accent the fella had, huh, Calvin? Yeah, he didn't seem to have a good grip on the English language, did he? <laughs> He's some kind of a foreigner. Let's watch him through the window. Ah, he's in the phone booth. He's talking to someone on the telephone now, see? Yeah, I bet it's Mrs. Terwilliger. Yeah, that's who it is, Mrs. Terwilliger. I hope he caught her in a gratuitous mood. Here he comes, here he comes. <laughs> well, I got to Mrs. Terwilliger. She was simply overwhelmed. Yeah, well, in round figures, just how much was she overwhelmed? <laughs> she said she's coming over and has a hundred dollars reward for us. A hundred dollar reward? Yes, and inasmuch as we found the pocketbook together, I thought we might split the reward 50-50. How does that set with you? Well, it squats with me pretty good. <laughs> yes, I think that's fair. I do hope Mr. Terwilliger hurries, though. Why, are you in a hurry to get someplace, mister? 
Yes, I have a rather important meeting in my office. I strongly dislike keeping my solicitor waiting. Well, if you're in a hurry, sir, uh, you can give us the pocketbook and we'll be glad to... No, I shan't want to miss out on my share of the reward. Oh, shan't you now? No, after all, when Mrs. Terwilliger gets here, she might decide to extend her generosity further. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Now look, mister, if you were in a hurry, I got 50 bucks here. I could give you your share of the reward. And then when Mrs. Terwilliger got here and wants to extend her generosity, we could get in touch with you later and all that stuff. <laughs> you know. Well, I guess that would be all right. You'll, you'll surely wait for Mrs. Terwilliger. Oh, surely. Yes, there you are, sir. 30, 40, 50 bucks. There you are. Well, thank you. Now I shan't have to keep my solicitor waiting. To Lou, old bean. Yeah, and a few beans to you, too. <laughs> Calvin, it's 10 minutes to 12. Now all we have to do is to wait for Mrs. Terwilliger to arrive and extend her generosity. <laughs> Colonel, it's a quarter after seven. You think Mrs. Terwilliger and her generosity are ever going to show up? Well, I can't understand what happened, Calvin. Seven hours ago, old Biscuit Head said that she'd pop right over. Yeah, Colonel, I've got a funny feeling. You think maybe you ought to do a little purse peeking and see if that $500 is all right? See if the moss got at it or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea, Calvin. I'll open it under my coat, and you can kind of look in there. I can't see anything. It's too dark in there. <laughs> well, light a match then. Now, can you see? Yes, and unless they're making money out of watered silk, there's nothing in this pocketbook but a lining. Let me see. <laughs> oh, Calvin. This is terrible. It's empty. We've been gypped. I've lost the rent money. Oh, Calvin, what am I going to do? Take it easy, Colonel. I'll pop into the apothecary and get us both an aspirin. It sure is nice of you to stick with me and give me moral support, Calvin, because I'm really down in the dumps. Yeah, it sure is a mess, isn't it, Colonel? Yes, I telephoned police headquarters and I talked to a man named Sergeant Graham. He says that the lost press gimmick is nothing but a confidence game. To think that I, Colonel Montgomery J. Claxton, would be taken in by a Yankee with a foreign accent. <laughs> yeah, and that money was for the landlord. You don't suppose your landlord would come up here and think, uh, Colonel, look at your apartment door. Oh, me, Calvin. Maggie Bell and Sister Sue will be back Monday from Nashville. Calvin, what in the world am I going to do when those two grizzlies get home and find they're going to have to be hibernating in a flop house? <laughs> I've got to get some money to pay the landlord. I've got to get it.
action. Cut. $50 for the rent. Tell you what, let's pull the old gimmick ourselves and double our money. Well, now, wait a minute. We're liable to get in trouble. How could we get in trouble doubling our money? We've got the pocketbook. All we have to do is to find the sucker. Yeah, but are you sure you have the gimmick straight? Certainly, Calvin. I've got it in my mind step by step. The pocketbook, the phone call, Mrs. DeWilliger, and everything. Now, come on, let's go. And now watch this. Uh-oh, here comes the phone. He doesn't look like we ought to have much trouble with it. Yeah, look at him there. Go to work, Colonel. Oh, excuse me, old chap, but I believe I saw that pocketbook first. Uh, you talking to me? I said I believe I saw the pocketbook first. What pocketbook? The one line right there. I don't see any pocketbook. Of course you did. You saw it lying there. Oh, I did? Oh. <laughs> Excuse me for intruding here. I happen to be an innocent bystander. I think you both saw the pocketbook at the same time. Uh, certainly. Now then, the first thing to do is to open the pocketbook and see if we can find some clue to the rightful owner. <laughs> yeah, that's the right thing to do, all right, stranger. Well, how do you like that? Must be four or five hundred dollars in there. You saw it with your own eyes, didn't you, sir? Jeepers. It did look like a lot of money. Yes, and while I was looking in there, I saw it belonged to a Mrs. Herbert Terwilliger, 2432 Lakeview Terrace. I saw her phone number in there, too. I saw it, too. Uh, I'll bet if we took the pocketbook over to her, she'd be glad to get it back. Oh, yeah, we could take it. Uh, 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 wait a minute, sir. Uh, that's not the way it works. <laughs> now, right now is where I pop into the apothecary and call up Mrs. Terwilliger. Yeah, you catch her in a gratuitous mood. <laughs> well, whatever you say. Uh, certainly, sir. Now, this total stranger, Mr. Burnside, here, and I will go into the drugstore and call her up. He might offer us a reward. Reward? Oh, boy. Yeah, now you wait here, sir. Come on, Calvin. Look at him out there, Colonel. We really got a dodo with this bird. Yeah, he isn't even watching us. Oh, this is like taking candy from a baby. Come on, let's go back. Oh, you're back so soon? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Terwilliger said that she's coming right over. She's really happy, all right. She said she's going to bring us a hundred dollar reward just for us. A hundred dollars? Oh, that's key. <laughs> Say, uh, by the way, don't you have to go someplace? Go someplace? Yeah, don't you have to meet your solicitor or something? Oh, no, no. 
I'm going to stay right here until that Mrs. Terwilliger gets here with my share of the reward. Oh, well, if that's all that's holding you up, old biscuit head, I'll be glad to advance you your share out of the pocketbook here. After all, it's Mrs. Terwilliger's money. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, look, uh, you think this is the right thing to do? Certainly it is. Now, there you are, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 10. Fifty dollars. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, nice meeting you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, did this thing work out all right, Colonel? <laughs> certainly, Calvin, certainly. Hmm. You see, he went off with our 50 bucks. So we end up with a total of $100. Yeah, but if we only have 50 bucks in the pocketbook, where do we get the other 100 bucks? Where do we get it? We just wait here until Mrs. Terwilliger brings it to us. <laughs> thing to do is just wait. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm not in the land of cotton. Just look here, boy, at what we've got. And look here. <laughs> look here. Oh, look here, Calvin, boy. <laughs> hey, uh, by the way, Lakeview Terrace is only around the block. He's taking a long time getting here. Colonel, seems like she took a long time getting here the last time, too. <laughs> Listen, you numbskull, what are you talking about? The last time. The trick is that there isn't any Mrs. Terwilliger. Don't you realize she's a fictitious character? Uh, well, if she's a fictitious character, what are we doing here waiting for? <laughs> well, you see, Calvin, the gimmick is... Y you see the thing... Uh, I mean, about... Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> you know something, Calvin? We have been swiddled. That fellow's a crook. <laughs> Drums have suffered enough for one day. <laughs> Those two sour old females are going to fly back from Nashville on the next plane. Oh, I'm really in a mess here. Yeah, I'd suggest you go throw yourself under a cross-town bus, but we don't know the bus schedule. <laughs> well, you know something, Calvin? Us Claxons of the old South never gave up if there was a fighting chance. I got a few hours to get everything straightened out, so I'm going to hock my granddaddy's gold watch and try that pocketbook gimmick again. But, Colonel... No, I've got the gimmick memorized good this time, Calvin. I've been going through it in my mind, and I'll guarantee you I just can't make any mistakes. Come on, Calvin, it's my last chance. <laughs> pocketbook first. Oh, you did. And I suppose now you'll call Mrs. Terwilliger and you'll wait here for the reward. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but say, uh, uh, wait a minute, mister. How did you know all these things? How did I know? You're the guy we had all the complaints on. Come with me. I'm Detective Sergeant Graham of the police department. <laughs> <laughs>
Southern charm. I can't help it if the young ladies find the old Colonel handsome. <laughs> handsome? Ha! Look at you there with the watery eyes and the sandbags under them. You look like old man River about to slop over the levee. <laughs> Mr. Sue is right. You're at the dangerous age. Me at the dangerous age? Ha! Maggie Bell, you were at the age when women either start getting interested in other men or giving tea parties. And I haven't seen a bag of orange pico around this house for the past six months. <laughs> Maggie Bell, are you gonna stand for that puffed up old foof talking to you like that? I certainly am not. I've had enough. Montgomery, out you go. And this time it's for good. <laughs> me uh, put me down one two wait a minute a man's home is his castle i'm the king here three <laughs> Calvin, it was nice of you to take me in last night when my wife threw me out of the house. The old colonel will never forget you. Oh, that's all right, colonel. If one southern gentleman can't help another southern gentleman, I'd say southern hospitality is going to the dogs. I think our eggs are just about done. I thought your landlord took away your hot plate. Yeah, but I got around that. <laughs> You're frying real smart there. Yeah, you see, for fried eggs, I set the thing for nylon. For scrambled, I set it for wool. <laughs> Coffee coming right up. <laughs> well, all the comforts of home. Yeah, that soldering iron comes in handy. Calvin, I just can't eat. I'm heartbroken. Well, I don't want to interfere, but if Maggie Bell and her sister threw you out, I'd never go back. Yes, Calvin, I, I guess the thing for the old colonel to do is just to make a new life for himself. It's the only... Uh-oh, that's probably my landlord. If he finds you up here, out in the street I go. I'm Connie Cunningham. Well, I'm sorry. I don't want to buy any... Uh, 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 I don't need... Uh, I mean, I... Uh, 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 how to do? <laughs> I'm looking for a Mr. Calvin Burnside. I'm Calvin Burnside, uh, Miss Cunningham. No, no. It's Mrs. Cunningham. He's not home. <laughs> uh, Mr. Burnside, I don't think you understand. Don't I? No. I'm Mrs. Theodore Cunningham, the co-chairman of the annual charity masquerade ball this year. Won't you come in? <laughs> Yike. Uh, excuse me a minute. 
I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Uh, he's in here someplace. Oh, there he is. There he is. Uh, Mrs. Theodore Cunningham, may I present Colonel Montgomery J. Claxon? Uh, happy to meet you, Mrs. Cunningham. <laughs> and what can we do for you in connection with the charity ball, Mrs. Cunningham? Well, I was just wondering if you'd like to buy a ticket to the ball. They're only ten dollars. Well, now, that's tomorrow night. Uh, I don't know if even a man with my charm could line up a date that quick. Oh, but this is for charity. And there'll be plenty of unattached girls there for you to dance with. Unattached girls? Well... And that is, if you don't mind dancing with strangers. Ha, ha, ha. One dance with me and we're not strangers anymore. <laughs> That's fine. Here's your ticket, Mr. Burnside. Uh, thank you. And, uh, what about you, Colonel Claxon? Will you take a ticket? Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't go in for anything like that. But, Colonel, you said you wanted to meet new people. And a distinguished-looking gentleman like you would be such a credit to our affair. No, I'm sorry. A man of your charm and culture? No, really, I... A man so attractive. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> Here's the ten dollars. <laughs> Mr. Burnside, uh, suppose you went as Julius Caesar and uh, Colonel Claxon, suppose you went as Romeo. Well, there's a coincidence. They used to call me Romeo back in Nashville when I was an usher in the theater. I guess that's because I saw a lot of action in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll see you at the ball tomorrow night. To Lou. Yeah, and a couple of toodles to you, too. <laughs> well, this is something, Colonel. You as Romeo and me as Julius Caesar. Yeah, but I don't know about going to a dance without my wife. You know, the last time I had my arm around another woman was when I was helping out at the rumble seat of a Essex. Uh-oh. I know that's the landlord. I'd recognize that nasty knock anywhere. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Mr. Landlord, sir. Uh, how do you feel this bright, sunny day? Rotten. Do you have a visitor up here? Why, of course not. How could you accuse me of such a thing? <laughs> well, we fooled that stupid landlord, didn't we? Uh, get him out of here the first thing tomorrow. <laughs> Mrs. Claxon, as co-chairman of the ball, I urge you to attend. Well, I don't know, Mr. Cunningham. All your friends are going. I'm sure you wouldn't want to miss it. Well, I don't know. What do you think, sister dear? I think we both should go. It'll do us good to go out. So. Well, everybody's going as in a historical character. Suppose you come as someone like, like Cleopatra. <laughs> That's for me. And suppose your sister here went as, well, let's say, Juliet. Juliet? Yes, and we'll just have to see if we can't find some dashing Romeo for you to dance with. Sister dear, I do believe I'm going to enjoy this ball. I really do. Well, I'll see you at the ball. Good night, girls. <laughs> oh, sister dear, it's just gonna be like when we went to the cotillions back home in Nashville. Yes, it'll be like when you and I were young. It's a fair, isn't it, Calvin? Yeah. I wish there were pockets in this toga. I could put a chicken leg in here for later. You know, Calvin, old friend, I'm kind of enjoying this night out. I might even find a cutie and do a little two-step with her. Ha! Say, uh, speaking of cuties, look at the two old girls in the masks over there across the room. That Mrs. Cunningham told us there was going to be some unattached women here. Unattached? Those two look like they're falling apart. <laughs> so that's Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt. Huh. 
She looks like a mummy the Egyptians forgot to embalm. <laughs> Get a load of the profile on the thin one. If it wasn't for that protruding Adam's apple, she wouldn't have any shape at all. <laughs> oh, sister, isn't this a wonderful party? <laughs> Well, what's so amusing, sister dear? Well, I hate to spoil your evening, honey, but get a load of those two men over there. <laughs> Look at the figure on that one in tight. <laughs> that barrel chest and those scrawny legs. <laughs> he looks like a bull moose with the rickets. <laughs> You'd think the committee would do something about keeping people like that out of here. Yeah, yeah. Either the committee or the board of health. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Colonel, look at those two silly old gals over there. They're giving us the eye. I guess they haven't seen anything like us before. What's the matter, Colonel? I just got a real focus on those two gals, and a cold wave sort of crept over me here. I know they're supposed to be Cleopatra and Juliet, but Calvin... There is something very familiar about their repulsiveness. What's the matter, Sister Dear? Why do you keep staring after those two men? Why, we can do a lot better than that. Sister <laughs> Sue, I know I've seen them before. Especially the one in the tights. That dumpy little Cleopatra is Sister Sue, and that other one is my wife, Maggie Bell. Are you sure? I'd know those doorknob kneecaps anywhere. <laughs> You're right, sister dear. I'd know those bow legs anywhere. That bull moose is Montgomery J. Claxon. Calvin, my own wife is here two-timing me. But, Colonel, you came to the dance, too. I'm here for the sake of charity. Maggie Bell is here with another man. That's why she threw me out of the house. Calvin, I'm leaving. I am finished with that woman forever. Now, wait a minute, Colonel. Wait a minute. <laughs> that philanderer must be here with another woman. Now, sister, we're here too. I only came for sweet charity, but I just know he's here with some hussy. That's why he run away. He's afraid we'd recognize him. Sister, I never want to see Montgomery again as long as I live. Come on, honey. But, sister dear, I don't want to go home yet. I'm just beginning to feel my vitamin pills take hold. <laughs> I'll never look at that woman again as long as I live. You, Jezebel! Uh, how did do? Take this! Out! It's all over town. I feel terrible, Lambie Pie, to think I sold the tickets to Mrs. Claxon and you sold the tickets to the Colonel. More coffee, Teddy Baby. Thank you, Sweetie Boo. You're scalding my hand, Peachy Puddin. Awfully sorry, Petsy Wetsy. Oh, think nothing of it. It's only a second degree bird. <laughs> We simply must do something for that sweet couple, the Claxons. Pet, 
Pet, I have an idea. I'll go call on Colonel Claxon, and you go call on his wife. That way, we can explain the whole mix-up. What a darling idea. We can tell them how you and I split up the invitation list, how you went out looking for women, and I went out looking for men. Yes, isn't it wonderful how we can bring sweetness and joy to others? That's because we're so sweet and joyful ourselves. You're scalding me again, sweetheart. Oh, my. I must stop doing that. <laughs> How come you're sleeping on the floor? I loaned you my navy hammock. Oh, you wouldn't understand if I told you. Oh, I couldn't sleep all night, Calvin. Worrying about the way my wife two-time at the masquerade. Well, have you got any idea who the cobra in the alfalfa could be? No, but you know how these things work. Sooner or later, this fella is going to show up and tip his hand. This boyfriend of Maggie Bell's. Yeah, well, what are you going to do when this romantic reptile shows up? What am I going to do to him? I'm going to tear him limb from limb. <laughs> First, I'm going to grab his right arm like this. <laughs> then I'm going to take his left arm like this. <laughs> then I'm going to rip his head off. <laughs> and then I'm going to get real nasty. <laughs> oh, something, Colonel. You are a rip-roaring, stomping, fighting southern gentleman. Oh, yes, I... Come in. <laughs> I'm looking for a Colonel Claxon. I am Colonel Claxon. May I be of service to you, sir? Yes, well, I came over to discuss a little matter concerning myself and your wife. Well, I, uh... Mm. How did you happen to meet my wife? Well, she was on my list. You... Have a list? Well, how else could I keep things straight? Last year, I had a total of 32 women on my list. We've run into a wholesaler here. Uh, without being presumptuous, sir, may I ask you where you got this list? Oh, my wife made it out for me. Your wife made it out for you? Excuse me a moment, sir. I'd like to have a word with my friend here. <laughs> Did you hear what he said, Calvin? Yeah. I've heard of lover boys before, but I never heard of one with a wife for a talent scout. <laughs> what are you going to do now? I don't know, but it's times like this when I wish I wasn't a coward. <laughs> well, do you think you understand everything now? Yeah, we sure do. Well, that's fine. Good day. I'll see you again sometime. <laughs> oh, me, Calvin. This is a terrible thing. That man is a professional home wrecker. Yeah. You know something, Colonel? A uh, what? I wonder what he'd charge for a copy of that list. <laughs> Don't you worry, Maggie Bell. I know those home-wrecking hussies. They always come around. Mark my words. One of these days, she'll show up just as sure as the swallows come back to Capistrano. But I'd be so embarrassed to talk to her, I just wouldn't know what to do at all. Do? I'll tell you what I'd do. First, I'd take that hussy, and I'd pull every hair out of her head. <laughs> Then I'd bang her head against the floor like this. <laughs> I tell you, I'd clove hitch that hussy into Never Never Land. <laughs> I'll get the door, sister dear. Mrs. Claxon, I came here to talk to you about your husband. My husband? Uh, uh, yeah. Who is it, sister dear? A size 18 swallow! <laughs> Won't you come in? Sister, this young lady here has come to talk to me about Montgomery. Aha! Uh -huh. 
Mrs. Claxon, I understand you saw your husband at the dance the other night. I'm afraid I was the one who's responsible for his being there. Oh, are you now, <laughs> honey? Yes. You see, the way it started was, my husband and I split up. Oh, you got a husband. Yes. He went out looking for women, and I went out looking for men. Well, now that sounds like a dandy arrangement. <laughs> Young woman, just why would you do a thing like that? Why, for charity, of course. Charity? Since when has this kind of thing come under the community chest? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Listen, you hussy. Get out of here before I jam this bald-headed mop down your throat. Hussy? <laughs> Why, I've never been so insulted in all my life. Well, just stick around, honey. I haven't even warmed up yet. <laughs> well, I'm getting out of here. Good day. <laughs> oh, that's the girl, sister dear. I just can't imagine a man Montgomery's age looking at another woman. No matter how old tired they get, they never stop looking at her. That's why they put curtains on a hearse. <laughs> Tell me something, Judge. Why do you sit here in the park every afternoon? Oh, I like to sit here and commune with nature and feed our feathered friends. <laughs> feathered friends? Don't tell me they still have Indians in the park here. Oh, you boob. The pigeons. Oh. But, Judge, you said on the telephone that you have a way of getting Maggie Bell and the Colonel back together again. And indeed I do. My dear friend, this morning I convinced the Colonel he should start a new life of his own. How did you do that, Oliver? I had him put this ad in the personal column. Cultured and refined southern gentleman anxious to meet beautiful and gracious woman of similar tastes. Object companionship. <laughs> if interested, wear white carnation and meet the above on the mezzanine of the Baldwin Hotel at 9 o'clock tonight. Do you get it, Calvin? Do I get it? Huh. Uh, uh. Of course I don't. Well, I dropped by Maggie Bell's and Sister Sue's and gave the two dainty damsels quite a pitch about starting a new life for themselves. When I left, Maggie Bell was reading the strictly personal column and rather intently, I must say. Alvy, you're as smart as I am dumb. <laughs> to dine with me this evening. <laughs> oh, me. I wonder if Judge Clutch is right. Will my dream girl show up? I got a feeling. I just know she will. Wait a minute. Someone's coming up the steps. It's a woman. <laughs> oh, my dream girl, you've come to me at last. Montgomery! Sister Sue! <laughs>
I traveled all over, you know, Brazil, Chile, Peru, and... Oh, by the way, that reminds me, Colonel, I took the liberty of giving your real estate office as a forwarding address when I left. Now, if any letters should come from me, you'll turn them over to me, won't you, old chum? Yeah, sure, old chum. Go on, nephew. Tell us more. Well, like I say, it's delightful, but of course there are some rather fierce tribes in the jungle. Really? How terrifying. Yes, you can get a shrunken head for $50. That's so. Looks like you got the $100 job there, Neff, old boy. You stand there, Montgomery. Carry Newton's bag upstairs. Here, Uncle dear, let me take that. It's too heavy for you. Why don't you just take care of the cab? I'll see you upstairs. That'll be four ninety-five. <laughs> He's having all his mail sent here, huh? Yes, Calvin. I'd sure like to know who's writing the boy. Well, you wouldn't tamper with the mail, would you, Colonel? Calvin, a southern gentleman, would never do anything like that. In the whole glorious history of the Claxton family, there's never been a tamper rap. Yes, things like that that make a southerner tremble with pride. <laughs> Well, look at there. The steam accidentally jammed under there and flipped the flap open. Yeah, it'll do that, all right. Well, so much for staying clear of the law. Now, let's read it. Of all the sneaky tricks. Yeah, using a lot of big words we can't understand. Your dummy, that's Spanish. Oh. Well, I knew I couldn't understand it. Uh, I just had the reason wrong. <laughs> hey, there's a word there that looks familiar. P-E-S-O. Peso. That's Spanish for money. You sure? Calvin, that's one word I know in every language. <laughs> Peso. That's like the great American dollar. Only difference is I think the peso has a picture of the Cisco kid on it. <laughs> just look at the heading on the letter. They got an oil well on there. And let me tell you something, son. In a South American letter, when you find an oil well and the word peso together, you know you're about to eat high on the enchilada. <laughs> we got to get this thing translated. Yeah. Say, I was just thinking, 
I know a gal that owns a tortilla parlor down the street. I was engaged to her once. She speaks Spanish. Well, let's go. You figure nephew Newton is liable to get suspicious? Oh, of course not. Why, the very thought of him getting suspicious of his devoted Uncle Montgomery is completely unbelievable. What are you doing, Newton? I've got a lot of valuables in my suitcase here, and I just want to make sure that dear Uncle Montgomery doesn't start snooping. Yeah, you can't be too careful with him. I remember when I got back from my last trip. That dirty crook came in here, and he swiped all the perfume I smuggled in from Mexico. <laughs> Everybody has to have a safe place to keep things. The government's got Fort Knox. I got my underwear. <laughs> And greetings to you, too. <laughs> we get engaged, and then I never see you again, you, you big cockaracha! <laughs> well, I've been kind of tied up. Business, director's meetings, tax problems, shooting pool, all that stuff. Well, what do you want now, fat stiff? Well, ma'am, you see, I... Oh, I'll just have a taco with all the trimmings. Okay, lover boy. I'm going to trim you good. <laughs> okay, here you is, kid. One hot taco. <laughs> now to get to the point of the visit, senorita. Would you translate this letter for us? The way you for to treat me, I do not know for why I should. Because I'm still crazy about you, Chiquita. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, I gotta get my vacuum cleaner fixed. All right, I'll read it for you. Senor Newton G. Hey Newton. Le avisamos que sus acciones en la Compañía Nacional Petrolera ahora tienen el valor de 10 mil pesos. Uh, what's it all about, Chiquita? Well, it seems Newton G. Hey, Newton is very lucky. She buy himself some no-good stock for two, three hundred pesos, and now, boom! One, two, three, four oil wells she come in. Now the company, she wants to pay 10,000 pesos for the stock. 10,000 pesos? Uh, how much is that in Confederate money? Oh, I do not know from Confederate, but it is three, four thousand dollars, maybe. Thanks for your trouble, Chiquita. Mm -hmm. uh, remember me to Pacho Villa. Well, Calvin, I'd say the next order of business is to get that stock away from Nephew Newton. That seems like the thing to do, all right. I wonder if he's got that stock in his suitcase. That's where he keeps all of his valuables. Say, Colonel... I just thought of something. You ate my taco. Why, so I did. Sorry, Calvin, old boy. I didn't notice. I guess I just absentmindedly put it in my mouth while I was thinking about that letter from... Yeah! No reason to take on like that, Colonel. It was only a taco. Yeah, thanks, uh, Calvin. Uh, now, of, uh, where were we? You were going to get the key to that suitcase. Oh, yes. I got an idea that he keeps his keys pinned to his long underwear because he's the only man that jingles when he sleeps. Well, maybe you could wait and get the key when he changes his underwear. No, no, Calvin. Who knows what may happen to the stock market by summer? Oh, yeah, no sense taking chances. Well, the first thing I gotta do is to see if that stock is in there. 
I think I'll go home and take that cowhide suitcase out to pasture. <laughs> suitcase in the living room when he went out, sister dear? He wants us to keep an eye on it because that husband of yours is a no good, conniving, <laughs> sneaky crook. That's the best reason I ever heard of. <laughs> Sneaking about. Impossible, sister. The only sneak around here is down at the office. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sir, we don't usually take an x-ray unless it's advised by your personal physician. Well, uh, uh he advised it. Uh, you see, they already uh, fluoroscope me. And now you need an x-ray? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, you see, according to the official medical reports on file at Bellevue Hospital, they tell me that my insides look like a pizza that's been rejected. Oh. All right. Step over here, please. Now hold it. Ready? Five, six, seven... Eight, nine, ten. Thanks very much, sir. Well, don't you want us to read it? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I'm one of those do-it-yourself patients. Uh, just send the bill to Colonel Montgomery Claxon, 432 Main Street, Philippine Islands. Good day, sir. <laughs> The stuff in the suitcase is superimposed over my stomach. Yeah, we have to figure out what's in your stomach and what's in the suitcase. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell whether that's a pair of socks with a hole in it or a bursted appendix. Yeah, it will take a little diagnosing. You see anything that looks like a stock certificate? Not yet. Hey, look down here in the corner, Kelvin. Hmm, Campania National. Petrolara. That's it. Yeah, that's it, all right. I see it peering at us through your giblets. <laughs> but how do we get it out of the suitcase without the key? Yeah. You know, the fellow that invented locks sure ruined a lot of deals for us. <laughs> I know what. I'll put the suitcase back, and then I'll meet you over at Oliver Wendell Clutch's office. What do you want me to do with the x-ray? Hmm, hang it up on the wall, son. Where the way my arteries weave through my elementary canal there, it kind of reminds me of the Great Lakes region. <laughs> Do not use your telephone for a hammer. This is a recording. <laughs> the situation. You locked your wife's nephew in a suitcase. Then you took an x-ray of his underwear and found a taco worth $4,000. No, no, Judge. You've got it all wrong. I'll go over it again. Newton has some oil stock locked in his suitcase. It's worth maybe $4,000, and he keeps the key pinned to his underwear. Oh, an inside job, eh? <laughs> what about rendering the boy unconscious? Yeah, yeah. Maybe if I had been the boy with a boulder. Good heavens, no. Let's not be brutal. Now, I've been reading a book on the manly art of jiu-jitsu. There's a certain nerve that you can press that will render a man unconscious immediately. It's right back of the neck here someplace, and all you have to do is press it, and you go completely unconscious. <laughs> Come on, let's go, Calvin. You gonna try that jujitsu on Newton? No, Calvin, but I think Oliver put me on the right track. I've got another plan. 
Now let's go over to the real estate office and I'll tell you how we'll render Newton hors d'oeuvres to combat. <laughs> closet, will you? Watch it there, Calvin. You got a little list to the starboard there. <laughs> Straighten up. Come on, son. Now. <laughs> you want me to hide behind those clothes, huh? Yeah, and when I get Newton in the closet, you let him have it. Yeah, well... <laughs> Here come That's it, you dummy. Colonel, you said that you, uh, what are you doing there? What am I doing? I'm meditating. All of us yogis meditate at least two or three hours a day. You're a yogi? I didn't know they had yogis in this country. Oh, yeah, yeah, big thing. Really catching on. They even came out with a spike con to a chair for watching television. Amazing. Boy, I'm really sailing today. Hmm. Afghanistan just went by. How does this thing work? Well, you just sit like this with your eyes closed until a thought hits you. Oh, wonderful experience. I'd sure like to try it. Do you mind if I join you? Join me. Now, look, you can't have two yogis sitting around meditating in the same room. It's against the laws of the National Retail Yoga Association. Oh, I didn't know about that. Well, of course, there's no law against you going into that empty closet and meditating in there. Oh, goody. Now, uh, here, you take this, Newton. Thanks, Colonel. Now, just squat down there on the floor and meditate. Uh, you think a thought will hit me? Yeah, you'll be in a trance in no time. Well, here goes. Everything's all set. I say everything's all set. <laughs> Just go in and get the key now. Something wrong, Colonel? <laughs> well, uh, thought didn't hit you, huh? I don't know. I started meditating and something went by my ear. Hmm, I forgot. Say, Newton, you know you're facing the wrong way. Every genuine yogi faces the mysterious east, <laughs> with the point of his chin facing up in the air. Oh, am I all right now? Uh, cock your head a little. That's right. Now, there's a nice meditating angle. You uh, think a thought will hit me this time? I guarantee it. <laughs> everything's all set. I say everything's all set. Sounded like a winner. <laughs> you want something, Colonel? Uh, you mean a thought didn't hit you yet? Well, while I was sitting here with my chin up in the air, I felt a thought coming at me from behind those clothes. Mm. I didn't feel quite ready for it yet, so I just stepped back and I sort of counterpunched. <laughs> There's the thought right there. <laughs> What you were after, Colonel? 
You're wise to the whole operation, aren't you, Newton? The only thing I don't understand is why you wanted it. There's nothing in my suitcase this trip that's worth anything. Except maybe my oil stock. Well, that's what I was after. I was going to pay you for it, but I, I just didn't want you to go to all the trouble of taking your key off of your underwear and opening your suitcase. <laughs> you were going to do it for me? Why, Colonel? Because I'm so crazy about you. I love you, nephew, dear. Let's not get sloppy, Colonel. <laughs> but it so happens that I want to hold on to that stock. I paid $400 for it. They say one of these days they're going to drill an oil well on the property. Then the stock will be worth a lot more. Well, you haven't heard anything. Uh, they probably hit a dry hole and the stock is worthless. You must have some inside information. But I'll tell you, I'll sell the stock for $400, no less. I'll give you two fifty. Mm, I think I'll go home and tell Maggie Bell and Sister Sue about you making me a yogi. So for four hundred. <laughs> the money back to the house. We'll close the deal. <laughs> Charming wife and sister in law to look up to date. <laughs> Come on, Maggie Bell. Uh, no rush, but we might as well get the deal over with. Uh, got the stock? Right here. Good. Now, here's the 400. And sign this little transfer slip right here that makes the stock officially mine as of now. <laughs> right. And that closes the deal. I still don't see why you want this oil stock, seeing that it's uh, worthless. Newton, old boy, I got a surprise for you. It just so happens that I opened a letter addressed to you that says the stock is worth three or four thousand dollars. Colonel, I've got a surprise for you. I wrote that letter before I left South America. <laughs> <laughs> Later, fellas. Come on, Calvin, after him. Thank <laughs> you. 